Good evening. I'm Sarah Estelle. I'm a professor of economics at Hope College and also the director of Markets and Morality. It's on behalf of Markets and Morality that I welcome you this evening. Um, we're really excited to have Dr. David Beevil back with us again to speak this time uh, remotely to all of you. A couple things I would like to do before introducing him. One is to thank our most excellent co-sponsors, our good friends at the St. Benedict Institute, our constant supporters in the Department of Political Science, and our generous benefactors this evening, the Acton Institute, who made it possible for us to bring you this live stream. Second, uh, a programming note. Um, we are so happy to have all of you here with us, so we wanna make sure that we leave time for your questions for Dr. Diebel. So after a short lecture, there will be a time of discussion between the two of us, but then all sorts of time for your questions. So I want you uh, point your attention to the submit question button. Please feel free to submit a question at any point this evening. We will try to ask as many as we possibly can uh, at the end of our program. Uh, we would love to share your name and your affiliation with Dr. Devil that helps us to bridge some of the social distance, even as we are physically distant. Um, but if you would like your question to be asked anonymously, please just be explicit about that. We're happy to follow your instructions. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. David Devil. Dr. Devil is the editor of Logos, a journal of Catholic thought and culture, and also visiting assistant professor at the University of St. Thomas. The 2013 winner of the Novak Prize he has written over 300 articles and reviews in a wide variety of books and popular and scholarly journals, including America, First Things, The Journal of Markets and Morality, Library of Law and Liberty, National Review, Nova et Vetera, and The Wall Street Journal. Personally, I look forward to his contributions at the Imaginative Conservative, where he is a senior contributor. And I'm sure you'll all join me in looking forward to the release of his new book later this month, a co-edited volume entitled Solzhenitsyn and American Culture, The Russian Soul in the West. Tonight, Dr. Diva will be speaking to us about some of the lessons Solzhenitsyn has for us under the topic, A Frame for Freedom, Submitting to Truth as Creatures of the Creator. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Diva. Thank you, Sarah. I'd like to thank uh, the Markets and Morality Group. I met many of them uh, last year when I visited Hope's campus. It was nice to see them. I even recognized a couple of them. And I thank those at the St. Benedict Institute, Acton, and of course, the Political Science Department at Hope. And I'm very, very grateful for your hosting me. I'd like to begin by talking just a little bit about my title, A Frame for Freedom. Uh, one of the things about Solzhenitsyn is that he was a great fan of the work of the English writer G.K. Chesterton. And uh, one of, Joseph Pierce, who's one of the biographers of Solzhenitsyn, talked about how when he had proposed doing some interviews of Solzhenitsyn for his biography, he wrote, he wrote to Solzhenitsyn and he said that uh, he had written a biography of Chesterton among others and Solzhenitsyn said, all right, you can come and interview me. And when Pierce got there, he saw on the shelves a whole line of Chesterton books. And I think that uh, Chesterton was a great influence on him, and he thought alike they were two great humanist scholars who believed that the human person had incredible dignity and power and capability because human beings were made in the image and likeness of God. We are like the creator as creatures, but we are also unlike the creator. And what makes us different is that we have limits that God does not have. We can see those as negatives or we can see those as positives. Chesterton liked to talk about the fact that those limitations made us capable of being who we were meant to be. And he used to use the image of the frame and a photograph or a photograph or a picture that's been painted. And he said, you know, in, in a certain way, it's the frame that makes the picture, what you include and what you don't include. And that's the way I'd like to think about freedom with Solzhenitsyn, because that's the way he thinks about it just as well. Um, and I think that that's something that we might, you know, intrinsically understand in certain ways. But in other ways, in Western culture, we've come to understand freedom to be something that means not having limits. 
um, that you know it's what I can do. Freedom means choice, an unlimited choice. And of course, in certain contexts, that's not a bad thing uh, because not everything needs to be limited completely. But at the same time, true freedom, that, that uh, capability that we have of responding to what we've been made and to be, to be flourishing creatures requires that we stay within the bounds of certain limits. Uh, freedom doesn't mean just simply doing what I want to do in that sort of shallow sense, but doing what I ought to do. Yet it's an odd thing for us. Solzhenitsyn, though, emphasized it a number of times. And one of the places he did was in his, his uh, speech, Repentance and the Self-Limitation of Nations. Listen to this. After the Western ideal of unlimited freedom, after the Marxist con concept of freedom as necessity, <clears throat> as acceptance of the yoke of necessity, here is the true Christian definition of freedom. Freedom is self-restriction, restriction of the self for the sake of others. It's kind of interesting, isn't it, right? He locates the idea of true freedom as a kind of golden mean between a kind of Western ideal or perhaps a Western caricature of freedom as unlimited and a Marxist ideal of submission to necessity, of what we would say today as being on the right side of history. Both ideas are wrong, but whether they're really truly opposites is another question. So I wanna talk about them and I wanna talk about them in reverse order and talk a little bit about that Marxist concept of acceptance of the yoke of necessity of being on the right side of history as they would put it, of, of doing what is, is entailed in this. Um, I think one of the reasons why I wanna talk about it is because people are again, thinking that perhaps that sort of vision really is what we need to do. They see this sort of Western caricature of freedom and they say, no, we need limits. And they think, oh, this, this idea is, is one that will properly limit us. And the problem with that is, is that they often are not aware of what historically that socialist and indeed communist vision has really entailed. <clears throat> um, one can find this notion in a lot of different places, but it really flourished in Marxist societies and particularly in Solzhenitsyn's own life in the Soviet experience, in this notion that there is a kind of necessity that we must accept about what the true path of progress is. And Solzhenitsyn liked to ask the question, right, about our concepts of progress as well as about the Marxist concept of progress. Progress in what? What is the direction in which we are walking? Many people punt on that question. Why? Because they have an idea that it's about where the party is going or perhaps where the nation or the state is going. And the only way in which that can be the mark of progress is if God is a part of the picture. Atheism is really the condition to have having a Marxist concept of necessity and accepting the yoke of necessity. But I think this is kind of controversial too today. Right? Because many people see atheism and they say, no, atheism is about freedom. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're on the internet at all, and you are right now, you've probably seen people saying things like, well, you know, you want to be enslaved to this sort of Middle Eastern despot God. And they, think, they think of the idea of being limited by God as, as a thing that is chains. We need to break off the chains that then enslaved us. Well, the difficulty with that is, is that we when we don't have those chains, we often adopt others. Now, <clears throat> when we don't have those limits of God, we're going to accept chains. We're going to accept terrible things. Now, some people will say, okay, but you look, this is fine, but you know, there are atheists who follow their conscience as well. And I think that that's true, and I think we need to admit that. I think there's a kind of equivocation that often goes on when people say, well, we can be moral without God. Now, if you mean by that, that we that people who don't believe in God can follow an objective moral order right on their own, I think that's true. But I think that's a very difficult, difficult thing. If you mean we can be moral without God to say that that we really can have an objective moral order without God being being real, then I think we have a problem. Because if if there is no objective moral order that comes from a transcendent God, 
right, then there's not really much of an incentive to follow it. And how do we know that it's really there? You can make the same sorts of skeptical claims about that objective moral order as people do about the one under God. Well, who says it's there? I want to do this. I want to do that. Now, it's interesting that Solzhenitsyn was honest enough in his writing, uh, as were many of the other great writers in, the, in the, the Soviet era, to acknowledge that there were such people of conscience who didn't believe in God. But the question is, aren't they pretty rare? I'd like to quote from a very good article from several years ago in Commentary Magazine by Gary Saul Morrison who's one of the great scholars of Russian literature. He's at Northwestern University. And his, his article was titled, Among the Disbelievers. And he was talking about this, this condition of, of Soviet rule, which was atheism, something that uh, Solzhenitsyn himself wrote about. And Morrison writes that memoirist after memoirist, including the atheist Lydia Ginsburg, testify that in the Soviet camps, the only people who consistently chose conscience, even at the cost of their lives, were the believers, right? Many atheists had consciences, but following your conscience is a little more difficult. Morrison writes, it did not seem to matter whether they were Jews, Orthodox Christians, Russian sectarians, or Baptists. Well-educated atheists succumbed readily under pressure, but believers and believers alone did not. Uh, now, by quoting this, don't mis mistakenly think that I think that all religions are the same and one religion is as good as another, but I think that it's, it's safe to say that those who believe that there is a God who gives an, an objective moral order are more likely to follow it. I'm not saying that all religions are the same. But, when I, but what we have to admit is that many atheists uh, did take, take the path of conscience, and when they saw what consciousness, what conscience led to, they often became believers in God. In other words, they followed that path of conscience back to its source. And I think that's really interesting, right? Because what they had perceived was that theism, this belief in a God who establishes a moral order for human beings that is the guide to their ultimate development and flourishing, is finally incompatible with Marxist society. Right? It's incompatible with the Marxist notion of necessity and this sort of substitute uh, progress or will of the party. But atheism was and is perfectly compatible with this Marxist necessity because it, it allowed you to say, well, then the true criterion for what is good is the party or the state. In the Templeton Address, uh, which Solzhenitsyn gave in the 1980s, he wrote about this, and he said it was Dostoevsky who drew from the French Revolution and its seeming hatred of the church the lesson that, quote, revolution must necessarily begin with atheism. That is absolutely true, Solzhenitsyn says, but the world had never before known a godlessness as organized, militarized, and tenaciously malevolent as that practiced by Marxism. Within the philosophical system of Marx and Lenin, and at the heart of their psychology, hatred of God is the principal driving force, more fundamental than all their political and economic pretensions. Militant atheism is not merely incidental or marginal to communist policy. It is not a side effect, but the central pivot to achieve its di diabolical ends. Communism needs to control a population devoid of religious and na national feeling. And this entails the destruction of faith and nationhood. Communists proclaim both of these objectives openly and just as openly go about carrying them out. I think you'll often hear some people say, well, if we could get back to the authentic Marx, you know, then we would get back to the real stuff. I mean, this later stuff was, was just a, a problem of Lenin and, and later Stalin. But the difficulty with this was that Marx himself identified in the 1850s the four things that he wanted to be abolished. And those were religion, the family, the nation or national borders, and private property. If we were to go and get authentic Marxism, it wouldn't look a whole lot different. And that's one of the burdens that we have to, have to face when we say, well, we can have a sort of a purified Marxism. Well, it's gonna have to go back beyond Marx. But of course, Lenin and Stalin and their followers 
were, were perfectly in line. Um, Bolshevik ethics were officially atheist and materialist precisely because atheism implied that there was no limit to the will of the party and the state. Soviet ethics couldn't allow any limits at all, even if, and they certainly couldn't allow God, right? There were no ethical principles, no permanently valid values, no human rights, none of those other things. Lenin said in a 1920 speech that we couldn't accept those things, those abstract principles. You couldn't even be a Kantian with your categorical imperative, right? Uh, because that itself was a kind of substitute religion. He said that ethics of any sort quote, based on extra human and extra class concepts were really just disguised moral principles, or excuse me, religious principles. And that is why we say, said Lenin, that to us, there is no such thing as a morality that stands outside human society. That is a fraud. To us, morality is subordinated to the interests of the proletariat's class struggle. In other words, Marxism, was based on a concept of relativism, right? Because all ethical principles are ultimately relative to the final dogma of what is in the party's interests. And of course, as we, as we might guess, the party's interests uh, were the interest of those who are in charge of it. There are no things wrong per se. Things are only wrong as long as they are good for the party or uh, or they are only uh, wrong as long as they are bad for the party and only right as long as they are good for the party. There's no right to life, not for the unborn certainly, but not even for those who've been born either. Violence is justified based on what the party wants. You see, the repressiveness of theology had been replaced by the repressiveness of ideology and ideology demanded that people accept that. Now, two things resulted from, from this necessity, especially with regard to violence. In order to operate under this kind of a system, the authorities had to retrain people to actually be cruel and not kind, to not show mercy, to not have any reticence to do under others what the party had told them that they must do. Right? This, is the, this is the great problem, right, is that all of these totalitarian systems have to tell people that killing right, unjustly is right. And what they have to do is get as many of them to do it as possible, because once you are implicated, misery loves company, and the guilty will cling to the fact that they're not just guilty alone. <clears throat> the principle of using force for the Soviets, when, uh, when only if necessary, was actually reversed. And the principle became, you should use violence unless it's, unless it's not necessary. Right? Violence had to be preferred so that the Soviet citizen wouldn't get squishy and start resisting commands to use it at any time. But this is the interesting thing about human beings, is that no matter how far gone we are, we're not quite able to be evil for evil's sake, because otherwise we tend to break down and go crazy. Thus, we had to change the language. To do evil, Solzhenitsyn writes in the Gulag Archipelago, a human being must first of all believe that what he is doing is good or else that it's a well-considered act in conformity with natural law. Fortunately, it is in the nature of human beings to seek a justification for his actions. That's a kind of a good thing, right? Because we, it's good that people have to come up with a reason for why, what they're doing is right. The bad thing is, we're pretty good at coming up with reasons why what we are doing is right when we know it is wrong. Because natural law in no way allows for the kind of things that the Soviet empire wanted people to do. The same in any of those other empires of lies in China or elsewhere. The violence has to be covered up in the human heart and excused. We must lie. Solzhenitsyn writes in the Nobel lecture, that violence finds its only refuge in falsehood. Falsehood, its only support in violence. Any man who once acclaimed violence as his method must inexorably choose falsehood as his principle. At its birth, violence acts openly, 
and even with a kind of pride, but no sooner does it become strong, firmly established, than it senses the rarefaction of the air around it and cannot continue to exist without descending into a fog of lies, clothing them in sweet talk. It does not always, not necessarily, openly throttle the throat. More often, it demands from its subjects only an oath of allegiance to falsehood, only complicity in falsehood. Right? It's interesting, right? It, you don't necessarily have to use force on people, but what you have to do is make them promise to agree with the lie. And if you can't make them promise to agree with the lie, you can make them complicit in it. You can make them act as if they believe it. This falsehood meant a complete change of vocabulary. Gary Saul Morrison quotes the poet Nadezhda Mandelstam and her observation that the word conscience disappeared from the Russian vocabulary during the Soviet era. Right? What was, what was given for it? Class consciousness. <laughs> now, by the same token, Morrison writes, kindness became something to be ashamed of, and its exponents were as, as, as extinct as the mammoth. Positive words now included merciless, ruthless, as well as total, as in total extermination, immediate, as in immediate execution, and mass, as in mass resettlement or mass terror, along with, without, without exception, without compromise, and no halfway measures. Right, it's interesting that language is, as so many people, uh, including George Orwell in the 20th century, but from the very beginning, right, we've noticed that this violence and this evil must be cloaked in lies and we must change people's language. The freedom of necessity, right, this Marxist freedom of necessity ends up being a hideous enslavement. There's no freedom to do what is spoken of in the heart no freedom to say what is good and what is evil. Kindness and mercy are no longer options, and nor is truth-telling. What's interesting is that without God as the creator, the human being disappears very quickly. First, the soul disappears as it becomes more and more deformed. But eventually, under a system in which God is not present, the human face can be erased, and human beings can be erased in large numbers. But what about the notion of unlimited freedom that is in the West, a kind of absolute libertarianism? Well, Solzhenitsyn thinks that this is a new phenomenon. We have many people today, uh, political theorists, uh, who try to, try to make the argument that, that the American experiment, for instance, was itself a completely uh, enlightenment phenomenon in which this was, the, this was the credo, that you can do whatever you want, and it is the self. Solzhenitsyn would not agree with that. He always said that he, he admired the great American founding fathers, that he thought that they had the right idea. <clears throat> he doesn't think that this is what the West or America was about. And he writes in his 1978 Harvard address that in early democracies, as in American democracy at the time of its birth, all individual human rights were granted because man is God's creature. That is, freedom was given to the individual conditional, conditionally in the assumption of his constant religious responsibility. Perhaps some of you know the famous lines of, uh, you know, of somebody like John Adams who said that our constitution is only meant for a religious people. That's the kind of sense that Solzhenitsyn had. And he said that this wasn't some sort of uh, you know, rare thing, but he says that this was the inheritance of over a thousand years. This is what Christianity had brought. And yet, he observed that this notion of being able to do whatever one wants, that rights include every desire of the human heart of imaginable, is certainly one that has developed since then. And he sees it in many ways uh, in, in our particular culture, in the way in which people are demanding to be able to say anything they want, to do anything they want, as long as it is within legal boundaries. And he thought that this was something that was very problematic because laws can change and the enforcement of laws means that uh, what is legally possible can often be stretched to its limit. It's a, it's a false notion, but it's one that had grown up. And he thought that it had grown up because of 
of materialism. And by materialism, I mean not only a love of luxury, but also the sense that this life is all there is and that the human person is only a bundle of, of uh, atoms and cells and stuff. Uh, the, uh, the new atheists like to call us moist robots. And that, of course, is what many of us think of ourselves as, as a bundle of, a bundle of desires that are ultimately physical in origin. And he says, this is part of the problem. This, it's this kinship, he says, between Western culture as it developed over the last couple of hundred years and the Soviet Union and the Marxist conception. Both of them were materialist and both of them were ostensibly humanist, but what we might call secular humanist, right? They're human beings as the measure of all things. The problem is, is that both kinds of, of humanism ultimately are degrading, right? We often, when we measure things by man, if we don't measure things by the true image of man that is the image of God, we're going to have a false conception. Uh, we will not be free, but we will become part of what the writer Harold Rosenberg called the herd of independent minds. When we focus on our material wants and desires, we will become ever more willing to say or do anything and to sell our souls. That's that hidden kinship, our godless materialism. And of course, it fits with what Karl Marx said in 1844, that communism is naturalized humanism. And the further we get along that sort of humanist path, the further along we get to where people think, ah, I think that socialism is really the thing. And the more that people embrace that, the more they'll want to be consistent. And they'll go down that path that is the furthest and most centralized to what, com to what we call communism. <clears throat> Solzhenitsyn says uh, that this statement of Marxists was not entirely senseless. One does see the same stones and the foundations of a despiritualized humanism and of any type of socialism. Endless materialism, freedom from religion, and from religious responsibility, which under communist regimes reached the stage of anti-religious dictatorship. Concentration on social structures with a seemingly scientific approach. He says this is typical of the Enlightenment in the 18th century and of Marxism. Not by coincidence, all of communism's meaningless pledges and oaths are about man with a capital M and his earthly happiness. And as we said before, what, what we see when man becomes the measure of all things, what he says in the Harvard lecture, man with his imperfections and his cruelties and his greed, right? when we see that as the measure of all things, pretty soon we're going to be measuring ourselves according to an, a, a very destructive idol. As C.S. Lewis pointed out in The Abolition of Man, when we get rid of that natural law, when we get rid of those original platitudes which place us under God, and what we are going to end up doing is not making man the measure of all things, but a few men, and they will exercise a dictatorship. So what's the answer? Well, the answer, as we talked about at the very beginning, is true freedom. We can call it Christian freedom, but it consists in recognizing that we are under God, that we do have limitations, and that we are going to have to have a kind of slavery. St. Paul likes to say in a number of his letters that we are, he is a slave of Christ. And of course, he says that in the, the epistle to the Romans that we're either going to be slaves to God or we're going to be slaves to sin, slaves to disordered desires in ourselves, and ultimately slaves to the disordered desires of those who are stronger than us, who will force us to participate in their, in their own schemes. We have true limitations that God has placed on us. And of course, the biggest one is what we've, we've, we've been adhering to before, this sense of the natural law. C.S. Lewis, again, likes to say that he's not a partisan of any natural law theory, but he's a partisan of the natural law. We may have differences in how we think about it, but we all know that there is this objective moral order above us, that there is justice that stands over us and judges us, and that there are certain things that are wrong. Right? For those who adopt the idea that the party or the state is the big thing, right, and the, really the only criterion for rightness, they will say that the ends justify the means. Now, of course, 
if we're talking about a situation in which something is not intrinsically wrong, it's not wrong per se, that's fine. The ends can justify the means if the means are good. But Solzhenitsyn believes, as does the entire Christian tradition and, the, and as well as the Jewish tradition, that there are certain things that are wrong. There are evil actions that we must not do. <clears throat> that natural law and that law that, that the ends have to be good and so do the means is accompanied also by the fact that we have a direction for freedom, that we have duties ourselves that go beyond the material. We have duties that are to ourselves that may are spiritual in nature. He wrote in the Templeton lecture that our life consists not in the pursuit of material success, but in the quest for worthy spiritual growth. He will often talk about external versus internal things. And he says the external serves our internal, and our internal then is directed at building up the external. Solzhenitsyn didn't believe that it was just about saving your soul, right? But he believed that in saving your soul, then you will reach out and you will try to change culture so that others will have that capacity for freedom. <clears throat> the laws of physics and physiology, he says, will never reveal the indisputable manner in which the creator constantly day in and day out participates in the life of each of us, unfailingly granting us the energy of existence. When this assistance leaves us, we die. We have to be in touch with the end of our freedom, which is spiritual growth. And the most important thing, practically speaking, that he says that limits us is the fact that there is truth itself, right? Because truth itself is the final criterion. We have to be bound to the, to the rule of what he calls in his <clears throat> essay, Live Not By Lies, which he released just as he was being exiled uh, to the West. He says, we have to have personal non-participation in lies. And he gives a list of things in that speech that I'm gonna, I'm gonna read to you because I think that it's important because it's really the criterion for our freedom that we, we not participate in lies because once we get involved in lies, we will be trapped in them and we will no longer be able to move. And we all know that, right? Once you tell one lie, then you have to tell another lie to cover that lie up. And pretty soon you don't know the truth yourself. But he says that if we want to, to participate in truth, we will not participate in lies. He says, we will not, everyone should agree with this. We will not henceforth write, sign, or print in any way a single phrase in which his opinion distorts the truth. We will utter such a phrase neither in private conversation, not in the presence of many people, not on one's own behalf, not at the prompting of someone else, either in the role of agitator, teacher, educator, and not in a theatrical role. We will not depict, foster, or broadcast a single idea in which we can only see falseness or distortion of the truth, whether it be in painting, sculpture, photography, technical science, or music. And it's interesting that many people think, well, you know, entertainment is entertainment, right? Paintings are paintings, but they can lie to us. We have to be careful about not participating in those forms of entertainment that tell us lies. And if we do, we have to be bold enough to, to speak out and say that they are lies. One who does not want to participate in lies will not cite out of context, either orally or written, a single quotation so as to please someone to feather his own nest or to achieve success in his work if he does not share completely the idea which is quoted or if it does not accurately reflect the matter at issue. He will not allow himself to be compelled to, take, to attend demonstrations or meetings if they are contrary to his desire or will, will neither take into hand or raise into the air a poster or slogan which he does not completely accept. One who does not wish to participate in lies will not raise his hand to vote for a proposal with which he does not sincerely sympathize, he will vote neither openly nor secretly for a person whom he considers unworthy or of doubtful abilities, will not allow himself to be dragged to a meeting where there can be expected a forced or distorted discussion of a question. He will immediately talk out of a meeting, excuse me, walk out of a meeting, session, lecture, performance, or film showing if he hears a speaker tell lies or purvey ideological nonsense or shameless propaganda. 
and he will not subscribe to or buy a newspaper or magazine in which information is distorted and primary facts are concealed. Of course, we have not listed all of the possible and necessary deviations from falsehood, but a person who purifies himself will easily distinguish other instances with his purified outlook. It sounds pretty drastic, doesn't it? And of course, we need to have prudence about these questions about what, what kind of materials we buy. But I think even with saying that we need to have prudence, we need to not have a, a kind of false prudence that allows us to say things that we do not believe are true. I think that this is a very difficult uh, time for this because there is the sense that silence is uh, itself an approving of ideas. And sometimes you, silence is not even allowed. Sometimes we need to speak out, but at the very least, we need to not allow people to think that we believe things that are false. This is difficult. This is tough. But it's the limit that we have that will really allow us true freedom. Solzhenitsyn, I want to close with a story that Solzhenitsyn tells in the Gulag Archipelago about an old woman who's being interrogated. And he, she is being asked uh, to tell uh, the, the uh, existence of uh, a particular Orthodox bishop, and they want her to tell, you know, where he is, or at least, uh, at least confess to something. And she says to, to the interrogators, I'm ready to die right now. You can cut me into pieces, but I will not tell you what you want to know, and I will not sign any documents. And what's remarkable about this is that Solzhenitsyn says the interrogators were so stunned by this this performance of the old lady, that they just let her go. Well, why is it that she had that freedom? Well, because she was not afraid to die. She actually told them, I'm ready to meet God right now. <laughs> and so go ahead. But that's the kind of, kind of courage that we need to develop. We need to see that we are limited. And the biggest limitation is that the truth is all important. And we need to be ready to suffer for the truth sometimes. And the way that we will not suffer as much is if we're ready to suffer at the beginning. The scornful looks, or perhaps even the, the social, out, you know, being a social outcast, but we need to do those things before the stakes get too much higher. Freedom has a frame, and it's a frame that will make us happy and that will make the picture of our own lives look a lot more beautiful and a lot more glorious. And that's the kind of thing that we should be wanting because we, are, in the end, are God's greatest artwork. Thank you for hearing me, and I'm looking forward to, to questions from the audience. Great. Thank you, Dave. And yes, please um, be reminded of the submit question um, button. We'll be accepting those throughout the remainder of the event. We look forward to asking those. I have a few questions uh, to start with, though, if that's okay. So many striking and even, I'd say, convicting statements that that you've made that, as I've heard them. And um, I'm struck particularly by the statement that the people of faith in the gulags were exercising morality in the most consistent ways and, and that the other people in the camps could follow the conscience back to its source. Wow, what a, what a great witness, right? I'm interested though in the possibility of the opposite for our, our current times, the potential appearance of self-righteousness, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, that to our modern ears, someone like Solzhenitsyn might sound kind of judgmental, um, that by emphasizing moral limitations under God, we might not sound humble ourselves or that we might be encouraging others to self-righteousness. What do you think? Are there dangers or risks here? Yeah, I mean, and it's interesting that, uh, you know, some people read Solzhenitsyn as a kind of, you know, he's a kind of uh, religious nationalist bigot and that he thinks that, uh, you know, the religious people are all good. But of course, he doesn't think that at all. Um, and his depictions of people are very honest, that sometimes the religious, you know, failed. But it is true that those who believed were, were very strong. But what's interesting about his own depictions, particularly of himself, when he writes uh, in his, his memoirs is that he is unsparing. Um, he, there's a passage uh, in the first volume of the Gulag Archipelago that's, that's very, very famous because he notes that there is this tendency to think, well, there are good people and there are bad people. Mm -hmm. And of course, 
uh, you know, it's very easy to, to start to do exactly the same thing that the Soviets did. Well, you know, you're what part of the good group and they're part of the bad group, or I'm part of the good group. And what's interesting is that he talks a lot about his own activities and his behavior before he even got into the prison, when he thought that he was one of the righteous. And he realized that he himself had taken advantage as a military officer of privileges of looking down on others and of, of, of you know, basically uh, taking advantage of the system. And he also saw that his heart was not all clean. The famous passage uh, from the Gulag Archipelago says, a lot, let the reader who expects this book to be a political expose slam its covers shut right now. If only it were so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart. He, he, he writes very bluntly about, about those interrogators and those running the camps. And he asks that hard question in several of his chapters. He keeps coming back to it that, you know, what, what, how are they different from me? Might I have gone down that path? I mean, we often say there, but for the grace of God, go I. And he literally means this. And he understands that, that many people were led down a path uh, that, that he could have easily been led down. And he's thankful that God's providence allowed him not to have done the worst things that he thought of or that were available to him. And he's thankful that he himself got those limits in prison, which made him start to think about limitations themselves and start to think about the fact that there might be something over him. So I think, you know, this interpretation of Solzhenitsyn as a kind of religious bigot is not, is not true. And it, he's certainly not a sort of, you know, Russian Orthodox bigot, uh, because he, he depicts many of these people that Morrison talks about. I mean, it's interesting that in, in One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, the hero is, is a man named Alyosha the Baptist. It was the Baptists who often were, were stronger than the Orthodox. And Solzhenitsyn was, felt free to write to the Orthodox leaders in one of his, in one of his many public letters about their own uh, perfidious behavior. So I think it's important to remember that, that Solzhenitsyn thinks of this as the human drama, and it's not some Manichaean struggle between, well, good people, us, and bad people, them. But at the same time, he says that, you know, even those who followed their consciences, you know, were following uh, the, the thing that God had implanted in them. I'm a, a big fan of the Live Not By Lies essay, so I'm so glad that that you shared that list with us. And we should tell folks who haven't read it maybe that it's like five pages, right? So it's a really great, powerful read uh, and not a big time commitment. Um, but I'm interested in this Living Not By Lies. It's a tough thing to do, as we can see in the extremity of uh, Solzhenitsyn's experience, right? But even in um, situations today where people are paying big and small prices for speaking truths or even staying uh, silent in, in some situations can be rather costly. Um, how does one best prepare themselves to have the courage to reject the pervasive calls to speak lies? Um, or at least, you know, or even to avoid giving the impression uh, that we are um, going along with the lies? Yeah, I, I think there are a couple of things that we can talk about. I mean, one of them is simply that focus on the truth and that ability to concentrate. Um, you know, it's interesting that, um, you know, we talk about, you know, things streaming online. And there's, you know, C.S. Lewis uses this phrase, the stream, in his book, uh, The Screwtape Letters, that, you know, we, that, that the devils want us to get caught up in the stream of things. Because when you're in the stream, right, it's very hard to go against the stream. And Solzhenitsyn is really aware of this, particularly in the modern world with mass media. And of course, you know, he died in uh, 2008, so he, he didn't know the half of it in terms of the way in which mass media could operate. But he already knew enough that people could get caught up in the lies that were being told and in simply uh, an inattention to truth itself. 
uh, he, he thought that what we needed was greater concentration on the truth and not being so caught up in the stream of things. Um, he himself, when he moved to America, he now had, obviously he had more access. Uh, when he was in Russia, he would listen to, to uh, the Voice of America and to foreign broadcasts to find out news. But when he got to America, it was all entertainment all the time. And it wasn't always so wholesome and it didn't help people concentrate. And so when he lived in Vermont for 20 years, he didn't have TV and you know he didn't pick up the phone because he wanted to have that ability to, to concentrate on things. Now you say, well, maybe that's a little bit extreme, but I do think that there is a, a big problem in our culture. Uh, we are all attached uh, you know, to our smartphones and to our laptops and to our tablets. And we don't actually pause to take that time to concentrate on the truth. And if we don't take that time to concentrate on the truth, we don't take that time to meditate over the truth. And I think he would say also even pray about the truth. We're not going to have that inner discipline to be able to speak, to speak the truth when the time comes or to refrain from giving the impression that, that, we, that we believe things that are lies. Um, so I think the concentration thing is a, is a really big one. Um, that we need a kind of asceticism of our screens, first of all. But second of all, I think what we what we really need is we need to practice telling the truth, uh, you know, in everyday life. Um, you know, I mean, you know, Solzhenitsyn was realistic too. Obviously, sometimes when you know when he was dealing with the KGB, he had to he had to cut a corner or two. But th this was not a sort of a common thing for him. Uh, what he needed to do was be, to be able to tell the truth as best he could and to tell it to the people around him. And I think that that's something that we need to, need to practice doing in those small, those small encounters when we'll pay a small price so that we'll get ready when we need to pay a bigger price. So I think, you know, there's probably more to it than that, but focusing on the truth and then practicing the telling of the truth are the, the two big starters. So you mentioned towards the end, um, artists and those who create things of entertainment value and the possibility of, of lies through those things. Solzhenitsyn was a literary artist. And sometimes I forget that as an economist. And I think of it as, you know, being explicitly just uh, narrowly speaking, kind of political in, in application, his work. But we have an interdisciplinary audience gathered here tonight. I wonder, does Solzhenitsyn have something to say to artists and writers in particular, the limitations that they might want to keep in mind as they seek to speak truth? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting in that list from Live Not By Lies that I, you know, that I gave you, he's talking about music and sculpture and plays. Mm -hmm. And he really felt that the artist had a very serious, serious role in, in affecting things. You know, I mean, there's the, all the famous lines that you probably remember from your English lit class about, you know, poets. Uh, you know, being the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And we might not think of poets in that way, especially today, but we do think of those who create these narratives and these stories. Maybe there's script writers for Netflix today who are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And Solzhenitsyn really believed that. And, and as a Russian, you know, he had a kind of belief that the artist had a kind of prophetic, prophetic duty. And it's interesting that, you know, if you've not read the, the Nobel lecture when he won the Nobel Prize, um, his lecture there was about the artist, but it was also about the artist's duty to, to society. And he contrasts two different kinds of artists. Uh, in one, the artist is sort of creating, uh, you know, out of his own sort of autonomous sense of the way things are. And on the other, the artist is trying to, to create something that's real, that's true. And in a work of fiction, uh, as he wrote many works of fiction as well, can obviously be true. They are, are meant to reflect reality. And he thought that artists had a special duty to, uh, to pay attention to reality and to make, even in their works of fiction or their plays, uh, that world depict the truth and not to depict lies. And so he, he thought that part of that was uh, to be able to actually speak. He spoke in that grand tradition of novelists who spoke to the situation in the world. Um, you know, I think the novel in our time has kind of died because it's all turned inward. And I think Solzhenitsyn would see that as a kind of a narrowing of the soul. The people are, are afraid to, to go out and look 
at the world and then de depict stories that tell the truth. Um, so he thought that that was very, very important. Uh, and, you know, and today, I mean, you know, thanks to the internet, we're all artists in a way producing things online. And so even if you don't think you're one of the grand artists, even if all you're making is a TikTok video and we don't have to get into the, you know, the problems of Chinese surveillance at this moment, but on whatever platform you're on, creating something that says the truth is something that we can all do uh, because we, are, we all are artists of, of a sort. And as I said at the end of the lecture, you know, we ourselves are God's artwork in which God has asked us to participate in making, making ourselves shine with the, with the light of truth. Okay. Great. Well, now let's tra um, transfer over to some questions here from the audience. Um, we have a question from uh, Ethan, who's a junior at Hope College. He wonders how Solzhenitsyn would respond to, if you can guess, the current politically polarized situation in the United States and, and in the West in general. Uh, how would he suggest we navigate a divided country that is speaking about at least two very different uh, ideas of truth? Yeah, well, I mean, this is an interesting thing because it does go into that uh, question of, of free speech. I mean, he would, I think he would say to us, we need to speak out on issues. And sadly, we've, you know, we, our sort of cancel culture culture has has become so prevalent that, you know, recent statistics show that uh, you know, over half of Americans are afraid to, to speak their mind on political issues. Mm -hmm. And of course, the answer to that is, again, we need to have courage to speak out to others. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that we need to be speaking constantly and nattering at people. I mean, one of my favorite cartoons is the, uh, the wife who is calling her husband away from his laptop, you know, to dinner. And he says, but honey, there are people who are wrong on the Internet. Uh, you know, we don't need to do that, but we do need to exercise that speech um, uh, very powerfully when, when we have the opportunity. And I think one of, the, one of the keys that he would say is that we really need to be involved much more politically at these lower local levels. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that he found disturbing uh, both about the Soviet Union and about the trend of the modern West is the increasing centralization of everything. And part of that is because people just don't get excited uh, about local politics. And yet, things still happen on the local level. And he thought that to, to, to maintain our freedom, we have to take up that responsibility, that political responsibility, in the place where we are. And it may not be exciting to be uh, you know, dealing with school board elections or local judge elections or you know, wastewater treatment issues and things like that. But the reality is, if we don't get involved in these sorts of things, they, we, we end up losing any capacity to, to get involved in them. So I think he would say we have to speak out about national and local issues, but then we actually need to actually, I think the problem is we often say that there's too much politics, um, but I'm not sure that that's quite right. I think part of the problem is there's not enough politics in that local sense and in that sense of real political action. We like to natter at people and we like to yell at them on Twitter, but you know, actually going to those meetings or participating in in you know conversations about what's going on at the local level and at the state level, that's really where we need to be. Thanks. Yeah. Along those same lines, we've been having a lot of conversations on campus about the upcoming presidential election. And so Sam, a, a sophomore student, um, she wants to know a, about you know, the, the current um, internal conflicts that we have the past eight months that it's really been pretty um, elevated. Uh, many citizens have taken a side that they are not willing to revise a, a truth, they think, that they're not willing to give up. Would Solzhenitsyn consider this new stubbornness as a civilian strength and willpower that he suggested the West needed many years ago in his Harvard commencement address? Or is this stubbornness related to chaos, separating us from his ideal civilian strength? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And, and you know, depending on what the issue is, I think he might say it's one thing or the other. He was very critical, even in the Harvard address, of the fact that even much of our mass media is is sort of, you know, has a kind of narrative that that it advances 
Um, and I think he would see a sort of revolt against uh, this sort of one-sided vision as, as healthy. I think he would see that it's also healthy that we have citizen journalists uh, who, are, who are passing around their own videos of, of what's happening. Uh, you know, you'll hear people say, well, things are just fine in Portland, Oregon. And then you, you can find out on the internet that, well, you know, in many parts they are fine, but in many parts they are not fine. And, you know, we've had a hundred days of sort of anarchists uh, uh, actually waging war against the police and setting things on fire. And you can find that stuff out by looking at people's Twitter feeds. You can, you can actually uh, get to the truth of that. Um, the stubbornness might might reside in in not looking at uncomfortable facts, and that's actually a that you know that's something that all of us need to need to to be aware of is that even if we think we're on the right side of issues generally, or even on the right side of one issue in particular, I think we do need to be open to the to to the facts that that are inconvenient for us. So stubbornness is good in one sense, but but I would think that he would say that we can overdo it. When we neglect the real truth that uh, that that you know that gets in our way, and actually it'll make us stronger if we deal with the full truth and not <laughs> and not try to cover it over. That's that's again that's why I like so much of his writing is that he doesn't he doesn't paint everything with a, you know with a single brush. Uh, there are ironies in the in the whole system. There were good people even among the camp interrogators. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, He's not afraid to, to say that, you know, a truth can be big and, and bold, and yet there are facts that make us have to look at each individual human in whom that battle between good and evil is raging in the human heart. So we have a big question from Anna, who's a member of Markets and Morality. She wants to know to what extent Solzhenitsyn believes that religion should play a role in government. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, I think I, in answering your question earlier, Sarah, I mean, you know, I point out some people thought that he was a kind of religious nationalist who believed that the, uh, you know, the Russian Orthodox Church should be running things. And I don't think that he thought that at all. Um, a very good book to read on this is Daniel Mahoney's The Other Solzhenitsyn, which kind of gets at some of these, you know, gets at some of these uh, these ideas about Solzhenitsyn. But he really did did not believe that everything should be run from a sort of, uh, you know, orthodox theocracy. Uh, but instead, he thought that there should be a, a great independence of people. But but have, saying that you don't want a theocracy is not the same thing as saying that you can have a secular, <laughs> a secular republic or a secular democracy. Because as we've been talking about, if a, if a society does not Accept those you know those general limits of the natural law, you you really can't have anything run. And the reality is that if a good portion of the people do not actually have this real living faith in God, quite often uh, the the acceptance of the natural law falls off. So having religion in society is different from having uh, you know a priestly or theocratic governance. Uh, but I think, you know, it's important to make that distinction. Sure. Well, I think we have a question from a philosophy major. Logan asks, you mentioned how Kant's categorical imperative isn't satisfactory for the communism or humanistic perspective. Can you explain in more detail why that is? Yeah, well, I mean, this is the thing is that, uh, you know, Kant's categorical imperative do only that which you would propose as a kind of universal law. Uh, you know that sets limits on things because it's it's what you think, and for the communist uh, understanding of ethics, what you think really doesn't matter in the end. Mm. It's what the party thinks, and uh, and that's why you know I, I quoted from this letter of Lenin uh, or this address that he gave. You know that any kind of abstract ethical concept was itself he thought a bad thing because it was, it was basically substitute religion. <laughs> and, uh, and so it doesn't matter, you know, this is the thing is that you could come up with a rule of ethics and, and you know, the party would say, no, that's not a rule at all. You can violate that. You can do exactly the opposite. And in fact, you have to do the opposite. So they, Lenin was pretty clear about this, that 
universal values, human rights, any of the things that, that you know, a lot of secular people today like to talk about, those, those, are, those, are, those are forbidden. And, uh, you know, and Solzhenitsyn would point out that once, once you try to take those things on their own without this sort of, uh, you know, vision of them as flowing from man made in the image of God, they, you know, they don't really work anyway. They're cut flowers and they will, they will wilt very soon. And in the, in the communist era, they, they not only wilted, but they were chucked out. So we, we have another question this time about um, uh, Solzhenitsyn's admiration for the founding fathers, or at least their ideas. Could you put that in conversation a little bit with some of the national debate we're having now on the, you know, what is the meaning and even when is the founding of the United States? How would Solzhenitsyn come down on some of those issues? Yeah, I mean, well, Sol again, Solzhenitsyn was very honest about things, but he thought that, you know, the founding fathers were in that tradition that did understand that that's it's uh, basically liberty is under God, and he certainly didn't think that our our pattern of chattel slavery uh, of blacks was was a good thing. But what he saw was a remarkable turn away from that because slavery has always been a part of of human history, and it's often been a slavery of particular groups, and that's what happened in the West in the modern era, and, and it was, by the, by the 19th century, it was very, very much racialized, but Solzhenitsyn thought, didn't think that that was good, and he didn't think that it was, that the, uh, the slavery in, the, in, the, in uh, the state of Russia was good in the 19th century either, but he was a realist who understood that societies do not change on a dime, and reforms do not change on a dime. But, here, but even further, I mean, I want to take this just one step further. Not only do they not change on a dime, but it takes a long time and it takes certain preconditions for things to change. Uh, the old civil rights movement, the old abolition movement, was actually motivated not by atheists, but it was motivated by people who actually believed in God and who were saying, no, we have a, we have a group of, of people who have wrongly understood that the image of God is different between black and white or black and Asian or between any of these groups. And they were the ones who claimed, claimed the truth about it. I mean, it's fascinating to look at Martin Luther King Jr.'s speeches. Mm -hmm. Here's a man who is steeped in the Bible and in, in the great figures. He quotes Augustine and Thomas Aquinas when he uh, writes his letter from Birmingham jail. And the reality is, once you get past that and say, well, we can, we can ditch that old fogey religious stuff, the reality is you may not get anything better. You may get something that's a lot worse. Um, what's interesting today is people will often talk about our moment as a sort of moment of increasing cultural Marxism. Mm -hmm. And some people don't like that term, but I think that, I think that it's an accurate term in many ways because Marxists define things based on your class. Uh, so, for instance, if you were hauled in front of the interrogators and you said, well, I'm not guilty, they'd say, well, it's not about guilt or innocence. It's about what class you belong to, right? It was all about this sort of group identity. Today, we're now becoming focused on group identity, whether it's your national origin or your race or your uh, sexual identity or your gender identity or what have you. And we now want to know, well, what, what group does that person belong to? I think that's that's uh, you know that's really dangerous because it's just a reversal, you know, of of that older notion that plagued American society up until the 1860s and a century beyond. Um, so I th I think you know moving into identity politics is a step back. And why are we moving into identity politics? Well, because we've lost that religious sense about law under God and being made in the image of God, a whole human race. Thank you for that. Well, we have another anonymous question. Um, a student asks, how can we as Christian students respond or act when we have professors that tell us lies? Can we respond? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, some people will say, just tell them what they want to hear. Um, you know, and I, I suppose if you're asking, if you're being asked, you know, the interpretation of somebody, I think you can you can say, well, this is the interpretation favored by so and so. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, you know, I, 
uh, if you're asking, should I kind of be a pain in class? Well, it kind of depends on whether the professor is willing to listen or not. Uh, but I, I, you know, I think even you as a student can make decisions to not, not participate in lies or say that you agree with these things. And I think when you're writing things, you can, you can, you can give your own views uh, because I think there still is at least some degree of freedom in in the modern university. And I think you can you can be brave about about saying things, but make sure that you do so in that courteous way, uh, and and not you know not be obnoxious. Uh, but also, I think when you're making your case, be as clear as you can about. Uh, about the difficulties in it. And, and I think many professors, even if they have, have an agenda or they have a, a kind of take on things, they'll be impressed if you can make that counter argument. Uh, they may not be convinced, they may not grade you higher, but I think that they will, they will accept that. So I, I'd say be bold, uh, but be prudent as well, uh, but still don't tell lies. So many questions coming in. <laughs> this is great, y'all. Thank you. Um, Cameron, another Hope College student, um, is wondering, in our increasingly secularized society, what do you think Solzhenitsyn would suggest as a remedy for that? Um, would this all be related to the distraction from the eternal truth by relativism, uh, found within the Protestant Reformation, perhaps, or among the Enlightenment philosophies that permeate our American society? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it's interesting. Solzhenitsyn sort of, you know, his view of history, he's often, uh, for those of you who read, uh, you know, the, the, the Harvard address, he's a little negative about the Middle Ages. Um, he thinks that there was a kind of imbalance in the Middle Ages in which uh, proper attention was not paid, not paid to the person. The person was cursed, he says, but he says it was, maybe we were cursed in the Middle Ages, but it was worse in modern times when we were basically stomped on. Um, you know, I, 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 he definitely thinks that the problem, I don't think he probably took the view that it's the Protestant Reformation per se, uh, but he does think that it, it happened in the Enlightenment. Uh, and precisely because in the, in the variations of sort of Enlightenment thought, uh, one that kind of came to predominance was the atheistic vision of those, you know, French Enlightenment figures and certain German Enlightenment figures. So I think Historically speaking, yeah, he's going to root it in those ideas and that growth of humanism. Um, in terms of practical, practically speaking, I think he would, excuse me, root um, our modern tendency toward that in our material success. Um, you know, again, he's not he's not opposed to you know material wealth or to to freedom, but he says it's just an odd thing about the human being is that when we don't have enough enough opposition, <laughs> we will often just sort of give way and we will lose our courage because we'll become addicted to our wealth. And I mean, the irony is that's really what happens in business too, is that, uh, you know, business people start off making sacrifices and taking risks. And then when they become wealthy, suddenly they're very much interested in, in laws which will keep other people from competing with them. And I think that's just a general truth about human beings is that uh, the, the, the thing that really fails is success uh, because we become attached to the fruits of success mm -hmm. and lose the things that got us the success in the first place. Mm -hmm. A student in um, Hope's political science department says, um, it's easy to say, do not participate in the lie, but it's much harder when we actually have to take action. What would be one tangible thing that we could do today to help ourselves not participate in the lie or to escape the lies that have ruled our lives. What in our lives today tempts us to continue living into the life of the lie? Well, I, you know, I think I've kind of said it before. I think we need, we need a kind of asceticism. Uh, and you know, that word is sounds, sounds very scary, but it means actual struggle. It means restricting ourselves in certain ways. Um, and I think that, you know, the asceticism that we could engage in is maybe that asceticism of our screens, of you know, refusing to get caught up in the stream or to, and you know, and I'm as guilty of it as anybody occasionally. You know, you click from one link to another and you're watching this video and that video. And well, I make I, you know, it's okay because 
I'm collecting research. Well, the reality is what I'm doing is I'm letting myself be caught along in the stream and I'm watching things that are not always not always great for me. Uh, so I think, you know, take that motion of asceticism and limit that screen time and then take that time to do something else that's better, like reading Solzhenitsyn or even better, reading scripture and, and taking that time to pray. Mm. So one of the nice things of having this live stream is we actually have family members of some of our Markets and Morality members joining us tonight. And so this is from a family member um, who's curious how critical theory plays into some of the concepts you've discussed this evening. Yeah, well, critical theory is one of the big things today that, uh, you know, and I see it on my campus and you probably see it on your campus. And I think it's, I think it's a very problematic theory because I think in many ways, it goes against uh, everything that 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 sort of what that American and Western tradition stands for. And I think one of the best things we can do right now is to be aware of of uh, what's going on in in that world of critical theory and critical race mm -hmm. theory. Uh, and I think there are a number of very good sources to learn about that. Um, there's a, a there's a new book by a group uh, James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose that's all about this. And now what's interesting about them is that they are themselves atheists and they're trying to, you know, they're trying to return back to a, a kind of, you know, lib, you know, an old fashioned liberalism. And I don't think that that's really sustainable. I think part of the problem is what social needs and diagnosed is that it's that sort of empty version of liberalism where God kind of disappears that led people to look for something that's much, much stronger. But I think that they do identify very well uh, what's in critical theory and how people who are doing critical race theory, particularly, um, how how they approach the world. Um, so I think I think that's that's going to be a very very important thing uh, for you to to educate yourself about and to uh, you know and I mean again it's being taught in many schools. Once you educate yourself and figure it out, I think I would investigate your own public or even your Christian or Catholic schools, because many of them are sort of taking, mm. taking those ideas and running with them. And I, I don't think that that's a, that's a good thing. I think it's very destructive. So going back to your point about screen asceticism, Reagan, another Marxist Morality member, wants to know whether, you know, what Souls and Eaton would think about the potential um, upside to access to this sort of media, since he was so skeptical and uh, of the the media and and the bias there. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's one thing that I think he would appreciate. I mean, that's one thing that he appreciated when he came to the West. In general was his access to uh, his access to all sorts of things, and we still do have a lot of access uh, to materials by which we can we can really educate ourselves in a very serious way. Mm -hmm. There was a, a very famous uh, Reddit question a few years ago about. The internet, and it was something like, "How would you de describe the internet?" And uh, it was, you know, the, I think the the top rated answer was something like, "I have all of the world's knowledge at the disposal of my fingertips, and yet I spend my time watching cat videos and arguing with strangers." <laughs> and I think, you know, that kind of sums up our problem, right? Is that this is a great tool. Um, but in order for us to use a great tool, we ourselves have to be disciplined. And that's his big thing is that technological progress is not going to do us a bit of good if we ourselves do not make moral progress and learn how to use it. Um, so I, th I think you're right. He would see, and I, I brought up the fact that, you know, he was critical of sort of the mainstream media, if we might put it that way. And he thought that oftentimes important truths were squelched. If we, use, if we use the web to try to find alternate sources so that we can actually figure out the truth, it's a great tool. But the problem is, you know, as I mentioned before, all too often we get lost in it in a sort of pure entertainment way. Um, so, so yeah, it's a good, good, good challenge. So perhaps as our, our last question, um, something about how we can achieve this this moral progress. Is there anything Solzhenitsyn has written that you haven't mentioned tonight that we should definitely check out? Any favorite work of his or even a favorite quote you would share that you didn't have the ability to work into this particular topic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, 
I've taught one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich, and I think that's a great short work. It was the it was the breakout work for him. But I think one, you know, in terms of this conversation, I think one of the great um, one of the great works is his The Oak and the Calf, and it's basically his account of his writing life up to the point at which he's exiled to the West. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's it's a remarkable book in many ways, uh, because in this book he uh, he he's the the image the oak and the calf is from the old story of of a calf who's butting up against an oak tree, and in his in in his mind he's the calf butting up against the oak tree of the of the Soviet Empire of lies, and what you know what he's trying to say is that. He is that that calf, but he's confident that you know, just as as uh, Jesus said, you know, with the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. Uh, with speaking the words of truth, that the that the calf could butt against the oak tree and actually move it. And I think it's a remarkable story that he tells about his own life of writing and how he navigated. Uh, speaking the truth and being prudent and how he thought about these things. Um, a student asked when earlier I, I met with some of the students in groups, and a student asked about this, uh, you know, Solzhenitsyn's Live Not By Lies uh, essay and, and how radical it is. And it's like, well, but, you know, you're, you have family that are affected by this. And The Oak and the Calf actually sort of deals with some of those questions about, about how he you know how he thought about his family because at the time that he was about to go into exile, he he did have, you know, several several young children, and he talked about his and his own wife's uh, thought about what they were doing, and you know they were determined that they were going to to tell the truth and they were going to be brave, and they were going to teach their children that, uh, because if they were not going to, if they were not going to live this life and they were not going to fight against. Uh, these lies, then what would they be teaching their children? They wanted them to be brave. And their children's souls, uh, you know, mattered too and in that great development. So I would I would take a look at the oak and the calf. Well, thank you for that suggestion. And thank you for this wonderful talk tonight and, and the discussion and answering all of these questions. Uh, we look forward to having you back in the post-COVID times on campus with us in person. Um, thank you thanks so everyone for Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure spending some time with you. Uh, this video will be available later if you'd like to share it with friends. Um, we will look forward to hosting you at a future event. Have a good night.